Our next speaker is uh, Gary Barth. Um, Gary Barth is uh, one of the uh, Northern California Medical Associates uh, ophthalmologists and, um, uh, and an old friend. Uh, Gary received his uh, MD degree with the Distinguished Class of 1976. At, Go Tom! <laughs> at uh, University of Southern California. Um, I had the pleasure of being a classmate with Gary, and it was a, a great uh, surprise and uh, pleasure to see him come to Santa Rosa about the same time I did. Um, his internship was at USC LA County Medical Center, uh, an incredible institution in its own right. Um, and um, he went on from, from that experience to do an ophthalmology residency at the University of Oregon in Portland, and then a fellowship in cornea and external disease at the University of California, San Francisco. And he's been here in Santa Rosa for 30 years. Um, the, the interesting part of Gary's practice is that he has done an extensive amount of volunteer work uh, in Nepal, and both performing and teaching corneal transplantation and cataract surgery. Uh, this morning he's going to discuss the advances in corneal transplantation in the context of his extensive experience both here in Nepal. So we're going to get a little bit of a travel log and uh, uh, a wonderful photo exposition as well as, as learning about uh, this interesting area of, uh, of eye medicine. So, Gary? Thank you, Tom. I want to thank Tom and the uh, invitation committee for inviting me and thank Dean Miner for an excellent overview of where we're going and uh, it's a hard hard talk to follow, but I'm going to drill down from the global, perhaps, to about a cubic inch uh, here in a minute. But uh, I had two missions for this talk. One was to talk about corneal surgery and, and, and how it impacts patients here and also the corollary of the, of the older style corneal surgery. But, it, but I was also asked to talk about how to develop a sort of a successful serial medical volunteer um, profile so that you can find yourself getting out of town and, and uh, I've come up with two axioms I'll present in a minute that I would never have thought of the first few years so let's go to the goals here so first I'm going to intro introduce a transformation in corneal transplant surgery and talk a little bit about the patient successes that we never would have expected years ago and then we'll describe the different surgical indications, and they're completely different really in the, in the developing world and uh, in America. And then the two axioms, um, what I'd like to do just for uh, three audience questions if I might, just to see how many in the audience have ever given serious thought, applied to go overseas or out of the, left your practice, go out of the country, or actually gone out of the country. So any of those three, you've, you've given serious thought, applied, and actually gone out of the country. Oh, actually, good number, good number. Okay, second question, how many have actually left their practice and gone somewhere to work somewhere else? So maybe about a quarter. So there's a number in the group that made an effort, looked into it, and, and didn't make it happen. Then the last question, of those that have been out of the country to work, how many have gone a second time, more than once? And how many have gone only once? A couple. In, in my practice, Bob Anderson, Dan Rich, and myself all went once and then just didn't really make the second one for, for years. And so, so axiom number one is start off by telling yourself, your partners, your CPA, your family, you're gonna go twice, okay? I'm serious. It took me a long time to realize this. It is very likely the first effort will disappoint you. If we're all type A and we want to make a lot of difference, we often will not find ourselves in a sustainable, be beneficial medical encounter. But we'll have tremendous personal value from it. And then the second time, you can refine your specifications, you can ask better questions, you can figure out where you want to go. So let me give you my example. So I told my partners I was leaving. I bought tickets to go to Asia. I told Direct Relief, a big organization, I wanted to go to Nepal. And everything was 
seemingly working, nothing happened, nothing happened. Three, four days before I was to leave, they gave me a call and they said, we can't find you anything suitable in Nepal. So this is a picture. That's me and my wife in a front page of a newspaper in, in a Nepal uh, language newspaper. But that didn't happen for 30 years, okay. What actually happened is on the right, they called me and said, would you mind going to the Dalai Lama's refugee hospital and working as a physician in, in the refugee camp? Okay, so most of us would probably say yes. I happen to have been a practicing Buddhist and was living at the San Francisco Zen Center when I applied to medical school. So I said, yes, yes, yes. Had a fabulous time, lived with the monks, stayed in, ate in the refugee hall. Um, actually had a private interview with the Dalai Lama. I said, you know, is there a chance I could meet? He said, yeah, come up around 10 o'clock. And it was just he and I in his living room for an hour. So, so the value of that visit was enormous, but medically it was a disaster. All the drugs were out of date. The blood pressure cuffs didn't work. The x-ray didn't work. Nothing worked. I, I had very little impact because I hadn't really prepared for it. So that's, my, that's number one is expect to make two trips if you really want to make a difference. If you just want to go out, go out. But if you think you're going to make a difference, the second trip often helps you refine what you're going to do. The second axiom really is it's true. Considering the ongoing impact of our patient encounters. So it's not just the two weeks or three weeks you're away. Most of our working hours are spent with people, or in our case patients, who really don't know us, but want to admire and trust us. And my view, somewhat like Dean Miner was saying, is effective medical practice is really a glorious confidence game. It doesn't matter if you're a nurse practitioner, if you're a physician's assistant, if you're on a telemedicine uh, link. If, if the patients trust you, that's our power to heal, is in, the, in being smart and trustworthy. And volunteering magnifies that good feeling in the office. And if you have a way, and it doesn't have to be through medical volunteering that inspires your patients. It really is transformative. And I, when I started going on a regular basis, that every day I look forward to going to the office. Patients look forward to seeing me. It, was, it really made a huge difference. So, so don't just think of it as encapsulated by the time you're away. Think of it as a huge benefit to yourself and to your office encounters. OK, now we're going to, on to medicine here. Ready? So the quest, first question is, why go teach corneal transplant surgery in Nepal? Well, I think this slide sort of says it. Kathmandu is in the center of the country on one way, but it's in the eastern third. It's the border of the eastern third and the western two-thirds. There are corneal surgeons in Kathmandu. There's some corneal surgeons down below Kathmandu on the Indian border. There are no corneal surgeons in the whole western part of the country, 38 million people. I worked in Cambodia. There's not a single corneal surgeon right now still in Cambodia. So if you needed surgery, there's no chance for it. There's no one in the western. There. And it's so hard to get from the west to Kathmandu that when I go there, I, I fly to Delhi and take a taxi to, to Nepal rather than try to get from Kathmandu to Nepal. It's, it's, real, it's a difficult country to get around by road. Okay. So one reason I was there was there was a, an evident need but here's the real evidence. This is, these are pictures I took in the first three days. Okay, I just stopped after a couple of days. So many white corneas. Everywhere I looked, white corneas. Why? It's agricultural injuries. It's, this is an agrarian economy. People work in the fields. They get injured. We get injured. Why don't we have corneas that look like this? There's two answers. One is limited access to physicians, nurses, anybody, really. But the big access is the over-the-counter use of steroid drops. So let's say you're smart enough to get an injury and put in polymyxin or neosporin, or if you can find it, eye drops, okay? Most agricultural injuries are fungus as mold. So if you get hit by a rose thorn, one thing you worry about is not so much bacteria, you're worrying about fungus. So these, most of these are fungal ulcers. They, if they get the neosporin, they put it in, it doesn't do much for a fungal ulcer. A fungal ulcer might be self-limited, but then they, someone says, try this drop. They go to a dispensary and get Decadron, and then everything turns to hell, and the cornea completely clouds over. So the big problem is injuries. Second big problem is lack of care. Third big problem is 
liberal availability of corticosteroid drops. And so this is what caused it. Now, what is the big cause? The big cause is sugarcane. Sugarcane is, you know, a tall, fibrous leaf. And, it, and if you're working with it, it can snap back and hit you. So these are all sugarcane injuries. Let me give you a sugarcane um, specific case, okay? So I was sitting in this, uh, I'll show you in a minute, this field, um, it's a, a forest hospital, okay? I was sitting in the cafeteria, which is outside. And I was drinking tea in the morning. Uh, um, and outside of this hut comes a familiar scene in, in the third world, which is a granddaughter leading a blind grandmother. So I'm just there watching, and they're real close to me, and they come out, and uh, the granddaughter deposits her grandmother on the step there in the sun, it's early morning, and she disappears, and she's just sitting there for a while and drinking my tea, not thinking too much, but then the nefarious one-year-old comes up and steals her walking stick, okay? So she's sitting there, and this kid steals a walking stick, and, and her, a true test of her total blindness is she doesn't pull the scarf off her head to look for her stick, she reaches around and just grabs the stick and then sits on it. So she's now sitting, she's now sitting on her stick uh, and the kid looking not too happy with it. So I think, okay, I gotta find out what's going on here because who knows what's under there. But it, it appears like an elderly woman. Well, it's not. She's 48. She has been blind in the left eye for a while because of an injury. And she re was working in a sugar cane field and got injured in the right eye and went on to perforate the right eye. So she now is totally blind, potentially treatable with surgery. So she's here in Nepal. She's from India, actually. There's no care in India. So she came over with her son, her granddaughter, and her came over from India to this uh, forest hospital to get a, a corneal surgery. But they ran out of money, so the son is now back in India, going back to the village to try to get some more cash and they haven't had any food for a couple of days. So when I started asking around, they hadn't been fed for a couple of days and they were waiting for the sun to come back and hopefully she can get surgery on one of these two eyes. But very common scene is blind people being led around by seeing eye, you know, grandkids. So if you, do, if you do succeed in doing surgery on one of these patients, you're really liberating two people from the blindness. You're liberating the patient as well as the, the, the child who really needs to take care of them. So let's go on to what, what would be the ingredients to launch a corneal transplant service. Let's say you said, okay, this, there's a need here. There's no one doing it for half a country. What do you need? Well, the first thing you need is a, a, a credible, solid, excellent, but dedicated surgeon who's going to stay there. One of the problems in the third world so often is if you go train someone, they may leave and go back to the big city. So you, so you have to find people who are invested and where they are, and I'm not going to leave. And so I found this fellow, Dr. Bidja. He, um, he started as an orderly. This is a true story. He started as an orderly in this hospital. He worked his way up to cleaning instruments, and he worked his way up to um, being a scrub tech. And then he went off, the, the docs there liked him so much, they sent him off to Russia. He went off to Russia at age 27 for 10 years, one year to learn Russian. He was there 10 years, came back as an eye surgeon when he was. 37, had three kids, left three kids when he was 27. And so he's invested, he, he's invested in this hospital, had been here for 15 years, and he wanted to learn corneal transplant. Did some academic training, but had never done one. And, but he had done all the, all the pre-work, if you will. So the first ingredient is to find a surgeon, okay? So this is a picture of one of the eye camps I was with Dr. Bidja at. We took over a high school, and in a, a small classroom, maybe about as big as this, did 200 cataract surgeries a day for three days. Did two, uh, 450, 300 cataracts in, in three days, 200, 200, and 100. And this is uh, morning rounds, okay? This is in the schoolyard of the classroom. And uh, let's see if I get my pointer here. Here, this fellow here is taking the bandages off. So all the people above him still have their bandages on from surgery yesterday. All these patients have had their bandages off. And then this fellow is uh, one of the two surgeons, not Dr. Bidji. You'll see him in a minute. And they have a little portable slit lamp. And he's just working his way down the list. And so in the morning, they do the 200 patient rounds. And then they start in the afternoon and doing 200 surgeries in the afternoon. Okay. 
So th these are, I watched Dr. Bidya do 60 straight without a break. No, no water, no juice, no tea. Cataract surgeries with uh, implants. So, so these guys have the stamina, the skill, and the dedication to, to learn a new procedure. So let me show you Dr. Bidja here. There, there he is in left. We were there in November, not, not the warmest time to be in Nepal. You can see by that. So this is the second ingredient. You need, you need some corneas. You can't just do corneal transplants virtual. Sounds like a good idea for other things, but not for here. And so 30 phone calls, five plane flights, all these corneas coming in. I ended up taking them through Qatar. That's another story over lunch. You can chat about that. Trying to, trying to get the corneas without them opening the box through the Middle East, not, not an easy deal. Uh, but eventually, we brought, I brought over 18 corneas, 11 the first time, and uh, 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 nine, the, eight the second time, seven the second time. And these are the corneas, and here's a happy man. So this is Sunday night, okay? So I arrived Sunday night. I'd already met him, so I, I knew him, and he was thrilled to have me, and I brought over the, all the equipment. So he'd never done one, okay, you ready? So the third ingredient is you need a patient worthy of these precious transplants, okay? So let's introduce you to uh, Babu Ram, okay? So here's Babu. He's here with 10 family members living in the forest. We'll get to the forest in a minute. Living with 10 family members, and I think some of you can tell he's not doing as well as he was. He was the major wage earner in the family. He was the senior guy, the patron of the family, if you will. So here's his right eye. Those of you who haven't done an ophthalmology residence, that, the, that is the cornea, or it once was the cornea. And we call it marbleized. It's just totally scarred over. There's no corneal tissue replaced. It's, it's skin, basically. But here's his uh, good eye. So what he has in the middle, this is a mycotic fungal bowl. This is, is injured by sugar cane. So this is uh, just pure purulence with fungus in it. And there is, even in America, there are no commercially available antifungal eye drops. Fungus is really hard to clear up. You have to make them up. Um, and they're not really available for sure in Nepal. So he comes in really in a desperate case. But right down here, he has a little bit of uninvolved cornea. Okay, so it's important because if, there's, if it's all necrotic, there's nothing to sew to. So he's a good candidate. So this, so this is when, this is Monday morning. Okay, Wednesday, next picture is Wednesday morning. So we get all set, get all the equipment sterilized, ready. He wants to have me do the surgery. I say, nothing to do. And you sit in the, you sit in the pilot seat. I'll be co-pilot, okay? This is Wednesday morning. I don't know if you can see all that, but right down here, this is Babu Ram's original cornea he was born with. And this piece in the center came from either Arizona or Florida or Texas. Where I, I mean, I just collected all the ones I could find. So he has an American cornea in the middle and a Nepali host right around there. There's his host, okay. And this is Babu Ram two weeks later. Oh, oh wait, no, this is... I just, this is not him surgery, but I, I put this in. This is Dr. Bidya doing surgery on one you can see better. This is, um, I don't know if you can see it. The needle holder's been used more than once. There's a suture, there's the needle, and there's the suture. You can barely see it. These are 10 aughts, 10 oh nylon, small. Those of you who do surgery, 10 oh nylon's not very big. And so they're, what he's doing, he's marrying the edge of the donor cornea to the periphery. And this is Babu Ram two weeks later. And so if you look carefully, Bruce Tucker says he can see these from the back. Can you see these, Bruce? See the stitches? Oh, God, good eyes. Okay, see those little stitches there? So that, that's him two weeks later, so he can see. So this is why I think it was worth traveling, going through customs, bringing these cornies over to introduce this kind of uh, technology to, uh, to a place that sorely needs it. Okay, now let's go into another part. This is more that social, this is where the PhD sociology person from Stanford would love to come to this place. This is the only marker of this hospital I ever saw. I've been there many times. This sign says 800 meters. Okay, well 800 meters is half a mile. So this hospital is a half a mile up this road. We are in the middle of nowhere, okay? And why? Why, is it, why do they put an eye hospital in a forest? It has to do with a number of things. Communication, nobody has phones. You can't call ahead and say, do you have any corneas? Do you have, can, I, can you take out my cataract? What's the, what's the waiting time? You know, do you take my insurance? No one has insurance. No one has any cash. No one has any phone. So you, you just build it someplace they can afford to go to. That's the key where they can afford to go to. If you build it in a city, okay, 
cash is king in, a, in an agrarian economy. If you're bartering things and selling things, you only get cash at certain times of the year if you sell something. And if you go to a city and you can't get in your surgery right away, you, you have to find a way to live in the city. Expensive. You have to find a way to eat in the city. Expensive. And in countries like this, I was talking with Tim Gieske a few minutes ago who goes to Albania and Kosovo. Learning the cultural differences is shocking of, of what people go through. One of the things you don't know until you go to, say, Nepal or India is people won't eat food from other castes. They only eat kind of in the castes they're in. So they don't go to restaurants. They wouldn't want to eat in a, re in a city. They don't know who prepared it, who touched it. So, the, so m many Indians carry their food with them all day long. And so, so it's really expensive to go to a city if you can't get surgery right away, and you never know because you can't call ahead and, and reserve it. So instead, they build a forest. So here's the entrance to the hospital. So there's a big gate here. Just walk in, and then it surrounds a huge campus, many, 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 many acres. There's gates all the way around to keep the robbers and the jackals out. The only way in, the only way in is this through gate and is guarded. So once you're in, you're safe. You can just stay there. So here's kind of the paradigm. This is the forest hospital logic. Show up, register, get in line, and stay for free until your surgery is performed. And that's what people do in droves. Hundreds show up a day sometimes. And they just camp out in the forest. They register. When it's time for their surgery, they, they come. This is a young fellow that we saw who, whoops, get back here, hang on. Um, who in injured his eye with a bottle. He was playing with glass, lacerated his eye. They just came by, they did the surgery. They stay a few days until they're sure there's no infection. They send him home. So he stays for free. Right outside the gate of the hospital are these sellers who sell beans and rice and dal and, and you know, material to make chapatis. And then patients just camp out. They use bricks and they sell sticks of wood outside. And you bring them in and you cook and you live, you live on the campus grounds until your surgery is done or until your surgery is you're cleared for infection. And this is a good example. This is a, I was sitting up early in the morning drinking tea. This is a lady getting uh, her early morning eye drops in her bedroom. So this is her bed. She had surgery. She's, she's sleeping on the ground there. And her maid is giving her uh, her early morning eye drops. This is the check-in center right here. And it, it's uh, rows and rows of lines, because they have hundreds that come during the, during the, um, the dry season when there's no planting. Um, and uh, amazingly, they do 29,000 cataract surgeries a year. 29,000. Memorial Hospital does 10,000 a year. Surgery with all its operating room, with all its doctors. These guys do 29,000 a year. So a forest-based hospital actually makes a lot of sense, given the cost of bringing someone to the city, cost of bringing eating in the city, cost of not being able to get your surgery right away. And then thirdly, or fourthly, it's really good for women, because women are hard to, women are hard to um, get to surgery. It's, it's about a two, out of, two to three ratio of men to women getting cataract surgery in cities because women often take more people to transport them. They also have to have a man and another woman. And so this is much cheaper than if you go to a city. You have to get more rooms and better lodging and so they can stay here and eat food. So it's, it's, a, it's actually women friendly having it in a forest. Okay, so let's go on to corneal indications. So in Nepal, as we've seen, it's really scars. People, they have opaque corneas, okay? In America, surprisingly, it's not, okay? In America, it's about 90% physiology and only about 5% scars. We don't have over-the-counter decadron, thank God. People get, go, to, go to practitioners if they get injured. Scars happen, but they're usually self-limited. People, people wear safety glasses when they work with nail guns. I mean, we've... We've upped our game so much, so we don't scar the cornea as much. But what happens is we're living so long. So this cornea here might seem scarred, but it's not. It's sort of the equivalent of, of dropsy or pitting edema. This is physiologic edema. So much like the, um, uh, the heart, you have to clear the fluid that builds up from gravity. So if your heart's failing and you're legs are swelling, they lose their, their luster and their turgor. This is the same thing. The, the cornea itself is in a permanently dehydrated state. If you put an ATPase poison, wabane or something on a cornea, it doubles in like a, like a dry sponge 
put a dry sponge in water, it doubles in size. The cornea doubles in size when it, when it swells up by its oncotic pressure. The reason all of us in this room are seeing well is we are actively dehydrating our cornea at all times. So our cornea is about 900 microns normally, and we sit around with about 500. So we're, 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 we're vacuuming out 400 microns all the time so that we can see. So in America, this is the reason. So why in America is this the reason? Oh, well, let me show, let me go through the revolution of, of that. Uh, let's see, we missed one, yeah. So the surgical revolution is uh, because we don't need this full thickness transplant. So here's Babu Ram up above. He had an opaque cornea with a fungus bowl in the middle. He had to take the whole thing out. There was nothing you wanted to leave. There would be fungus left behind, okay? And this is what I trained with. You see, at, at UCSF, we trained with full thickness corneal transplant. We did it for all patients, whether they had a scar or they had physiologic problems. That was, this, that was the surgery. It was long, it was risky, lots of problems with infection, whatever. This is the new paradigm. It's a partial corneal transplant. I'll go through what the, the eponym means in a minute, DSEC, but it's, it's a partial corneal transplant. So this is truly revolutionary. So let me see if I can get you to understand this. So in this cornea, Everything you see in the middle is from somebody else. Came from another person who died. That person might have been nearsighted, that person might have been farsighted, that person might have a stigmatism. We have no way to know. I, ran, I, started an, I started an eye bank here. I ran the eye bank at Sonoma for seven years. There is no way we were ever gonna find out when we, did, when we harvested a cornea at Memorial or Kaiser if that cornea was nearsighted, farsighted, steep, keratoconus. Just not available. So you, you, get a, you get a funny cornea sometimes. In this method here, if you were to run your finger across here, there is no lip. That cornea is inside, okay, inside. Let me say that again. This is the patient's normal cornea all the way across here. This cornea inside is like a contact lens on the inside of the cornea, okay? It's a partial transplant. Completely revolutionized surgery because we, in America, we only need this. We don't need the big guy. For a lot of reasons, it's better. So, so this is what has transformed it. In America, our demographics for corneal transplant is the elderly. I've done, whoop, I've done people, as, I've done a couple in the 90s. I did one guy, 97, he, he was a fisherman and he always opened trout fishing every year for so many years and he, 97, had a corneal transplant. Never would have happened years ago with the, with the, with the full thickness transplant. Way too long a recovery, way too much risk, but with the new, the new methods, you go ahead. So the etiology, in America, it's about 50% have a corneal endothelial dystrophy. They're just born with bad genes. The, the endothelial cell line depopulates and they don't divide. So whatever you're born with, you keep and you, you, you have less and less every year. And then somewhere in your 50s or 60s, the pump, the uh, kind of bailing pump can't keep up with the osmotic gradient and the cornea goes from 500 to 600 to 700 and it becomes cloudy like that picture I showed you. About half the patients we do actually have, do not have a dystrophy. They have normal endothelium, but they outlive the ability of the endothelium to pump. There is a, there's a decay curve of endothelium. It starts at 4,000 and heads down to under 2,000 just over time. And some people go down a little faster from surgery or trauma or, or um, retinal, say, or cataract surgery, maybe a retinal attachment surgery. Surgeries can, can knock it down a little faster. And so they outlive the fluid pumping of their endothelial cells. So they need an endothelial cell replacement. So here's the method. Now this really benefits from LASIK. Now I'm a huge LASIK fan. I had LASIK in 96. I'm sure that I'm the first one in this room thought LASIK was safe in 96. I love it. Done it on my wife, my brother, my godson, my goddaughter. But LASIK technology has, has really also helped me as a corneal surgeon. Because what LASIK does, those of you who know anything about it, you take the cornea, you make a very thin flap, like 100 microns. You pull it out of the way. You reshape the cornea with a laser that vaporizes what you don't want. Let's say you're near side, you just flatten the shape. And then you put the top back on, and it's so thin like a sock, it just fits over the new shape. So that's what LASIK is. LASIK, you make a, you take a, a, a fifth or a sixth of the cornea out of the way, laser the other part, and put it back down again. Okay, works fabulous. But what we've done is we've been able to use that technology and take the back six, change the way the LASIK machine cuts it, and so we take the back six of a cornea, which has the endothelial cells, 
And the iBanks do that for us in the iBank, and then they ship it to us with the, just that back piece which has the endothelium. So it's about, uh, it's about 150 microns, very, very thin. And then what we do when we get to the surgery is we go in the operating room with the patient and we strip, that's hence the name, it's called, decimates is the name of the back of the cornea, decimates stripping. We strip that out. So we go in there and we score all through the middle where that decimates membrane is and we pull that out of the eye because it's failed. It no longer has enough active pumping cells. And then we roll up, we roll up this a disc, and you can't really touch it because you'll injure it, and you roll it up and you stick it in the eye and then um, after much sweat and pushing and pulling and banging on the eye, you buoy it into the middle of the cornea. Once you get it in the middle of the cornea, then you do an air cast, much like if I broke my femur hiking, they would, you know, while they're waiting to get me to the hospital, they would immobilize my leg with some sort of air cast. We air cast it up on, onto the back of the cornea. And because it's a vacuum pump, that's why you I mean, happily, that's why you're using it. It sucks itself on like a leech. It just sucks itself on the back of the cornea. It needs no stitches. So stitches are reduced from 16 to 24 in the full thickness graph to maybe four or five to get the cornea in and then one instrument or two to mobilize it and introduce the air. So that's the DSEC, DSEC, de decimate stripping, endothelial keratoplasty. So here's some advantages, okay? <clears throat> Quicker recovery, both optical activity. They can bend over the next day, they can work on the treadmill the next day. This is a, a patient who had a couple, couple of months ago, there's three stitches there, one over there, and you can just see the cornea is sitting right in there, and it stays there forever. It never moves, doesn't dislocate. It's much less prone to injury. I've had several patients who I had the original corneal transplants lose their eye from an injury because the cornea being only 50th, a 50th and then it's an inch thick anyway, putting all those 10 nylon sutures doesn't a secure wound make. So those eyes are fragile. These eyes are actually really stable because you're way off to the side. Less rejection, using much less tissue. So instead of having to keep people on uh, anti-rejection drops forever, you, you don't need as much tissue um, protection because there's not as much DNA that's being transplanted. So a lot less risk from steroid drops forever, which is infection, glaucoma, other things like that. Now this, is a, this is a neat one. This is kind of a niche one, but it's really amazing. If someone had an old corneal transplant, let's say they had a transplant done when they were 45, they were 40, they were in, had keratoconus or they had a nail injury and they got a donor from someone who was, say, 60 at the time, and now they're 65 or 70. Well, that donor is 100 years old because that donor lives to 60 years and somebody else, okay? And then you get it and you, you backdate it 30 years or 40 years, right? Now you're 60 or 65, that cornea is 100, it's falling apart. So now what we can do is on these, on these successful corneal transplants where the patient liked the optics, could see out of it, we just, we just put the DSEC under the, so this is an, a regular penetrating corneal transplant here. The, the, you can see the host is kind of cloudy. And then we put a DSEC underneath that and just picks it right up. In a few days, the cornea starts clearing it. I mean, and these patients went through the original surgery with all the stitches and sandbags, and they just can't believe they're walking around the next day. So it's really transformative. Um, and this, this is, I think, the last slide um, on, on, on the transplants. Uh, this is also really a big deal. Um, with a traditional transplant, as I mentioned before, you're inheriting a new front of the eye. So you're getting astigmatism, you're getting all these things. So at the end of the surgery, we might pat ourselves on the back, the patient and I, that we have a clear cornea, but totally useless because they might, I've seen this, so they end up in near side of one eye and far side in the other eye, and they can't wear glasses and they can't wear contact lenses. And they really are not happy. They don't have functioning optics, but they have a clear cornea. So it's a, it's a kind of a pyrrhic victory. Um, with the DSEC grafts, they're totally on the inside, so they don't change the optics at all. They don't really even need to change their glasses, or at most maybe a couple of those clicks we all have to sit through at the optical exam. And so, so right away their eyes can work together again, because you're not inheriting the optics from the donor. You, have, you keep your own optics. If you're nearsight, you're still nearsight. And then if you do decide, like a cataract patient, you, uh, someday you want to upgrade your optics or improve your optics, you can have LASIK surgery on, on a DSEC cornea. So you can have like the LASIK flap on the back and you can put a LASIK flap on the front and you can get rid of your astigmatism like cataract patient. So a huge advantage. Safety is a huge advantage. It's, safety is a huge advantage. Quicker recovery is a huge advantage. Less drops, um, less corticosteroid drops is a huge advantage. Um, 
and then uh, it, kind of immediate access to good optics is a great advantage. Okay, so let's summarize. I have just five minutes left. That's perfect. Okay, in summary, medical volunteerism, which I'll encourage you to consider, is potentially fraught with frustrations. So just tell everybody right now, I'm going to go twice. Just tell everybody that, and then go out, do the first one, and then hone, your, hone yourself and your request and do the second one. Um, and also think about what it will mean in your practice, because most of us live much of our life in our practice. And if our patients are more connected to us, it really helps. Okay? And then regarding the corneal surgery, corneal transplant surgery has benefited from surgical miniaturization and LASIK technology. And just like laparoscopic and cardiac procedures, the quicker recovery and the safer recovery, and in our case, the optical recovery, has huge patient acceptance benefits. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions. is it to get donors? Um, are, we, are we increasing in our donorship or are, how are we doing on that in terms of you know, people donating it, corneas? We're very fortunate. I went to a meeting in, um, in Italy and the guy across from me was from Holland. He got all his corneas from, from the San Diego Eye Bank. He says in Europe it's very hard to get them. They don't have um, driver's license laws. They don't have corners that are aggressive. We're a net exporter of corneas. There's no shortage in America. So the eight, I, had to, I had to buy, of the, of the 18 I brought over, I had to buy one for a young girl. We're doing a 14-year-old, and all the corneas that, that kind of came available as excess were 60 or 70. But she was 14, so I had to purchase one from an iBank to get something that was you know, more age-related to, to her. But we, I had no trouble really securing 17 regular corneas. And that's, that's, you know, driver's license makes a huge difference. And... Um, Refrigeration makes a huge difference. Like they, they, in India, in Nepal, they have to go to the uh, funeral pyre people. They take the eyes out before they burn them. I'm serious. They go down to the guts, and that, this, if some, people die at home. There's no way to really collect those corneas. But in America, people die in hospitals or nursing homes, or and the corneas come out quickly. But thanks for the question. Anything else? Gary, do you Neil. have data on the outcomes uh, for the folks that you do these on? You talked about needing eye drops and rejection. I'm wondering if these guys are followed, like Bob Aram, what happens to them, you know, a year or two down the line? On the, D, on the DSEC transplants, if you use eye drops? No, I mean, uh, in Nepal, the guys in Nepal. Oh, Nepal. Um, it's very difficult to get medical follow-up in Nepal because you can't contact people by phone. Um, I just know anecdotally, I've been back a bunch and I've seen some of these patients. Um, it seems worth the effort, but you know, candidly, we don't have the, the, uh, the way to evaluate it. Even if they w can walk for two years or work for two years, it's great. The lifespan is short there. Tim, please. Uh, just uh, have you seen any changes in your ability to communicate in advance of a project? Uh, I know in Albania, uh, I can easily prepare because uh, email works so well. Uh, so you, you come and you're much more efficient. Is that a oh, yes, Sky call? Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Skype, uh, Dr. Bidger and I would Skype, you know, three in the morning or something. What do you need? What kind of equipment? Uh, you know, because when I first time I came, I was dumbfounded how useless I was because there was no way to do that back then. But now we can, we can put together a package. I'm, if I include this, what are you missing? What else do I need? It's, thank you for bringing that up. It's much easier to find yourself useful nowadays. Please. Yeah, so um, clearly the surgery that you brought to Nepal is, is huge. I mean, it's a huge effort. I'm curious what efforts and what the problems are to restricting the use of Decadron, since that's such an ideologic factor in those areas. Yeah, they have, a, that's a, when I was there last time, this fascinating idea, this is amazing. Um, they're handing out cell phones, but they're not connected for cell phones, the big Samson phones. And they download all these short videos about a, a basic health education, how to wash a nipple if you're breastfeeding, how to do this, how to put in, what to do if you get an injury to your eye, okay? And so they pay one person in a village, 
one person village to have the phone and to wire it up um, on a little um, solar uh, um, you know, battery. And then that person is paid just to have the phone and if anybody in the village has a medical problem, they go over there and they look through the pictures until they get to the one of an eye injury and they press that and then they have these videos, uh, their standard videos and they dub them into the local language and they give them out. And so they would, they would press an eye injury one and it would say, you know, in Marathi or whatever it is, do not buy these drops, you know, wash this, call a medical provider, look for these drops. So that's what they're doing for these illiterate uh, groups is they're locating the best person in a village and they pay them to be a, a, a video resource, fascinating, video resource, that's what they're trying to do. Because it's, you can't broadcast things like that. They don't, most of them don't read, you know, so please. Along those lines, um, what about eye protection? Is there any way to promote eye protection in that setting? Goggles. You know, it's, it's a non-glasses wearing, it's interesting when you go, um, when I was in, just aside, I was in Cambodia for a couple of weeks, nobody needed eyeglasses, nobody, okay. And then I was flying back on Korean Airlines, and I got onto the line at Korean Airlines. Everybody in the line with me had eyeglasses. And so it would be easy if you're in Korea to, to encourage safety glasses, because the genetics are crummy for myopia, OK? In, in Nepal and Cambodia and such, there's no need for glasses. Nobody wears glasses. They have these great, healthy eyes. So there isn't like a glasses culture. Does that make sense? And they don't read as much, so they don't go into bifocals. See, so glasses is not in their thinking. In America, we would think of that, because so many of us wear glasses. But in Nepal and Cambodia, there's just no glasses being worn. I mean, serious, nobody wears glasses. Um, and so I think it would be really difficult to, to provide eye protection. But that's what they're trying to do with these nurse, pre or, um, you know, kind of community nurses. They're trying to, to develop a strategies to develop health to prevent disease by doing videos on cell phones. That's a good question. I think my time's up. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that I can answer how difficult it is, um, but you know, I was in an eye camp one time. We did. Um, uh, two to three, two to three hundred a day, and I was the junior guy, and so I was doing all the post-op rounds, and I, I would be rounding on 400 people a day sometimes, and nobody got an infection in the in the first four or five days. But then after that, I don't know what's going to happen really. Oh, they use a, a pressure cooker. They have a little Bunsen. They have a little propane thing, and they have a pressure cooker, and they put in a pressure cooker, and they that's how they do it. They're, yeah, they're all pressure cookers. You know, when you go to the field hospitals. Yeah. Okay, I think I've run out of time. Thank you so much for your attention.